Cheering at pro wrestling shows in Japan is back, and 2023 is already shaping up to be a big year in the history of pro res. That's why you should listen to the Emerald Flow Show. From the Royal Road to the Green Mat, Paul and Gerard take you into the world of All Japan Pro Wrestling and Pro Wrestling NOAH. Not only do we analyze events, but we examine business, who is getting over, what angles are working, or not. Occasionally, we take a look at other Japanese promotions like DDT and Zero One. So if you're looking for more coverage of the world of Japanese wrestling, check out the Emerald Flow Show on the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network, available on all of your favorite podcast apps. Music. It's not just part of our daily lives, it's part of our wrestling fandom as well, and it has been for decades. That's where this show comes in. Music of the Mat, the podcast devoted exclusively to the music of pro wrestling, hosted by Andrew Rich. Hey, that's me. Each episode delivers a different topic with a variety of great guests, fun conversations, musical analysis, and of course, a heartfelt pun or two. New episodes drop every other Tuesday on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or your podcast app of choice. Check out Music of the Mat only on the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling Podcasting Network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. To the highway in a brand new day. Back to open the voice gate for March 21st, 2023. We are members of Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. You can find us on the Voices of Wrestling Podcast feed or our own dedicated podcast feed on all podcast platforms and applications. And while you're visiting those platforms and applications, please rate and review us. Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, however you get the podcast, it's just the best way for new listeners to find out about Open the Voice Gate. If you'd like to support the show, Click the link in the show notes. It'll take you to our redcircle.com landing site. You click the link that says sponsor this podcast and you can set up a one time, a reoccurring donation. No obligation whatsoever, but we would like to thank all of our previous donors. You can follow us on Twitter at Open Voice Gate. I'm one of your hosts. It's your old pal, Iron Mike Spears, joined alongside your other host, Case Sloan. Case, how are you this Tuesday? I'm hanging in there, Mike. You know, uh, as always, just tired, busy, uh, but. We have the World Baseball Classic Finals on as we record right now, and that has been such a bright spot uh, in my life over the past few weeks. So I'm hanging in there. How are you doing? How is can, can I ask? I don't know if we've talked about this on the podcast. Can I ask what your housing situation is? How that's looking? Where you're at in that process? Not that you don't have a home, but rather you're about to move into one. Yeah. So I can technically move in this week, which is nice. I just I. I did this move case in a way where I was both like originally I this was going to be a, a several month trial. I work from home before COVID, so I could still work from home wherever I am. And I decided to go get a place for a few months in Texas and to kind of figure things out while I work and found a place, bought a place. I, I, I got a place that I'm going to move into at the end. Or I'll technically move into it in this week, but I'm still having to like, go back to South Carolina, set, settle affairs there, get everything over here. So it's a process. Like my my house, I could technically probably live in it sometime next week because I'll have furniture at that time. But it, it, it's an exhausting process that I'm starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel. So that's what I'm getting through. I do have the WBC on as well, Case, and I'm happy that they always do the finals at Marlins Park. It is such a beleaguered uh beleaguered part of me baseball stadium that i have a lot of love for 
And what I, my favorite baseball memory when I lived in Miami was the DB was the WBC because I got to see Puerto Rico versus the Dominican Republic with all their fans. And it just was such like a vibrant experience that like, I know there are a lot of people who hate the WBC and think like the injuries are like awful and they should do no, away the, the, those, it. those people are dorks. This is such Thank an objective, this you. is such an objectively cool thing that I look forward to. And I, I quite frankly really missed it this time around. And I, you know, my baseball fandom wanes in and out quite a bit, but I have been locked in for this entire tournament. It, it, I really question anybody that doesn't just get the biggest kick out of the WBC. Yeah. And it's something that like, did the world think a lot of the World Cup when it first was started in the 20s and 30s? Probably not. The World Baseball Classic's only been around really for like a decade and a half. They've only had four of them. Yeah. It takes time. And the way that Japan walked off yesterday, and uh, did, did you notice like when, when they walked off, like all of the Japanese wrestlers going insane about it? Oh, did you see the photo from the Dragon Gate Dojo? I forget whose account this was on. It might have been Don I Fuji's. It was either him or ring announcer Kikuchi. Yeah, I think I think it was Kikuchi. Now that you mention it, just some some dudes enjoying, you know, quite frankly, America's pastime, and then also Mochizuki Junior, who admitted he has no idea yeah, anything about baseball, doesn't understand it, doesn't watch it. But that was that was a good time uh, looking at the lads there enjoying the the World Baseball Classic walk off. It's on the short list of sports things that I haven't done that I would really like to do. I'd like to attend a world baseball classic game. And I'd like to spend some time at a college world series, super regional. And those are, those are kind of the big things on my sports checklist. So super regional, not even Omaha. Omaha is cool. There's something about the intensity of the super regional specifically that I don't know. It's a thing with my dad and I, that we always look forward to it every year. And we just think that is the coolest thing. And I love college baseball. I had the opportunity when I was an undergrad to call college baseball. Uh, the University of Miami uh, used to be like the cream of the crop of college baseball. Yes. Has 40 or so straight uh, regional hostings until uh, recent years. So like I fully like when the light is kicking with a super regional, that's when I know Miami is back more so than ever, even more so than right now. The University of Miami being 2-0 on the whole entire state of Indiana right now. Look, uh, that is a plus in, in the the Miami column as I'm somebody who does not care about the University of Indiana at all. Fuck Bobby Knight. I also, before we pivot to Drangate, I'm going to say the biggest who cares thing of all time, but you brought up the University of Miami baseball. To me, the greatest baseball video game of all time that I've played because I did not play MVP Baseball 2005 with the Major League License, but I did play college baseball mvp 2007 the ea sports game with the college license and i had a very lengthy miami university dynasty on that game on the playstation 2 very fond memories of that so i i have a soft spot in my heart for the university of miami baseball team as a result of that hey i mean there was one person who basically made college baseball into like this giant spectator thing where the super regionals in omaha was a thing that became a show and that was the original uh, Miami coach base, a uh, Miami baseball coach. I, I'm blanking on his name right now, but his, but his nickname is the Wizard, and there's a statue of him, and he basically revolutionized it. So you, you, you picked the right team. March 21st is the date we're recording, Mike. It's a special day in Dragon Geek history. I'm going to ask you real quick if you can think of it uh, before I spill the beans on our mystery opening topic tonight. March 21st in Dragon Geek history, does that ring a bell at all? Is this the date of Memorial Gate 2018? Son of a bitch, you're good. Oh, my goodness. Memorial Gate 2018, which is relevant because although he comes back to wrestle one more match in May alongside T-Hawk and two of his OWE students in a, a spot show in Kyoto, we are five years removed from the last real Shima Dragon Gate match, and that seems very hard to believe. Yeah, and it, it is something that I don't know how much I want to attribute it to, like, the last four years being universally tough on everyone, but it feels like a lifetime ago, weirdly enough. Yeah, well, that's that's kind of what I, I want to get at here, is I, I want to just briefly look at this Memorial Gate 2018 card. 
because as Noah grinds to a halt and they have certainly had quite the week a a seemingly universally panned outside of a few deranged psychopaths a universally panned big show this past weekend you know all japan is somehow working with all of these different promotions and i I got into a very interesting conversation with somebody who used to live in japan and uh is still very much a, a follower of the japanese wrestling scene earlier this week this week and we started talking about some tweets we've seen from Japanese fans that attend all Japan shows. And now that they have this newfound partnership with Gleet, we're seeing a lot of tweets of like, Hey, we don't, we don't really want to be associated with these guys. Like we feel like this devalues all Japan by having these guys come in, you know, the scene, as we talk about a lot, is just not in a healthy state. But if you look at Dragon Gate five years ago to now, it seems to be a pretty healthy card. So do you mind if I run down the show real quick? Please do. Dark match on this show, Yuki Yoshioka versus Oji Shiba, which I think that alone, Oji Shiba and Yuki Yoshioka in a dark match, oh, how far we've come in the five years since. Opening match on the show was BB Hulk, UT, and Yosuke Santa Maria versus Shima, Gamma, and Problem Dragon. Dragon Kid and Kaito Ishida versus Jason Lee and Shooting Skywalker. An open the Brave Gate match that went 12 minutes and finished in a no contest. It was Punch Tamanaga versus Yasushi Kanda, and then Ryo Saito and Yamato versus El Lindemann and Shingo Takagi, a three-way six-man tag match with Maximums, Benkei, Masato Yoshino, and Naruki Doi versus Antiasas, Eita, T-Hawk, and Takashi Yoshida in the very early incarnation of Natural Vibes, Genki Horiguchi, KZ, and Susumi Yokosuka, and then a main event, Open the Dreamgate Championship, Masaki Mochizuki versus Big R Shimizu, what jumps off the page to you there? I think other than, you know, the dark match, uh, speaking of all Japan, that's where OG spends a lot of his time along with Gleet. I don't yes, know how sir. they I don't know how they managed to get that figured out. But I think it is that Antios pairing in a lot of ways. The El Lindemann and Shingo Takagi pairing? Yes. Yeah. Uh, that it certainly it certainly jumps out. I mean, it's it's why I'm so intrigued by the people that don't get Dragon Gate right now and aren't as into it when at one point they were, because I look at this show and look, I'm sure Dragon Kid and Kaito Ishida versus Jason Lee and Shun Skywalker, that kicked ass, but you sub out Kaito Ishida and that match can can happen. You know, that's still very much in the core of 2023 Dragon Gate. But there's that two match stretch there in the middle punch versus conda for the brave gate title and a, and a no contest at that and a heel conda heel conda baby face punch brave gate title i mean that is look it's not exactly jason lee holding the belt you know it's not exactly kaito ishida's year-long run there's a lot of things wrong with that picture it's not even you know susumu holding the belt it's just that's a pretty abysmal brave gate scene that that whole time period where conda was in the mix and punch was in the mix really devalued that belt and i don't think it was until the the year-long kaito ashita run that we saw people really care about the brave gate again and if you're a dragon gate fan that maybe picked up the product in 2020 or beyond you might look at a match like rio saito and yamato versus el lindeman and shingo takagi and you might think that sounds pretty cool and on paper you would be right but you know i've, I've said on here numerous times the 2018 feud between rio saito and shingo takagi nearly drove me to stop watching dragon gate it just I, I found it to be unbearable in a way where i couldn't really stomach it when it was on the screen and this was a down period for both yamato and el lindeman despite the fact that they were being pushed really heavily at this point i found both of them to be incredibly uninteresting and el lindeman he should have felt a lot better coming into that heel turn you know, like he had his big breakup with uh, over generation and that was tied into Yosuke San Maria and that summer venture tag league the year previous. But it just like his heel character, uh, it got good. Like he is very talented and he always has been, but it, it just kind of stuck out a little bit. And especially him teaming of Shingo didn't make things easier. Yeah, this is. You know, it's funny you bring up Shingo, and I think we can really transition to the big news at hand here because this is around the time period, and it's it, I, I don't have a specific indication of when it happened, but 2017 and, and 2018, certainly, you know, as, as Shingo prepared to leave, and, you know, we all thought he'd be this great freelancer, and he turned out to be 
just one of the strong, you know, tent poles of New Japan Pro Wrestling, main event at the Tokyo Dome, et cetera, et cetera. Even you and I, his biggest fans, weren't necessarily expecting that. But there was a point in time where somehow, some way, Shingo outgrew Dragon Gate. And he did it in a way that nobody had really done before. And I think the only person that has really rivaled him is Ata. And given the news that came out today, which I can let you expand on in just a second, uh, none of this is surprising. I actually think Ata's in a very similar position to where Shingo Takagi was five years ago. Yeah, and I would argue that, and we'll get deeper into this in a second, I would argue that uh, Ata might have been more marginalized over the year before he exited. I mean, you look at what happened with Shingo in his last 10 months in Dragon Gate. He took the step back from uh, Berserk as Berserk turned into Antios, and he was supposed to give leadership to the new generation. And he was adrift feuding of Rio Saito. And as we compare that to Eita, who as of 8.56 a.m. local time for me, that is about 8 p.m. Japanese time on March 21st, we got these tweets. At this time, we would like to give an update on the contrast status of Eita. He's expressed a desire to expand his activities. After negotiation, it was decided to update his contract to one that will give him the flexibility to do so while continuing to compete in Dragon Gate. They continue, We hope you continue support and expect big things from Eita and his endeavors both inside and outside of Dragon Gate. It's the, it, it's the uh, worst kept secret and like the shoe that everyone was waiting to drop since last spring, I would say. Last yeah, spring. I, I mean, I, I would certainly think anybody listening to this podcast was not taken aback by this news, and I would hope that if you've if you've listened to this podcast at all, as we've sort of hinted around this, especially last September after Ata wrestled Yuki Yoshioka in the main event of Dangerous Gate 2022 and bowed to all four sides and shook Yoshioka's hand and certainly hinted at him departing from Dragon Gate in some way, shape, or form, I feel like at that point we had a very rational conversation where there were some people wanting to jump off a cliff and say, well, they've lost Doi to freelance status and Shisa left and Gamma retired and you had all of the, you know, this old guard that had been there since the start started to wither away. And when Doi went freelance, I think people really panicked and just because of the negative press that Dragon Gate received, some fair, some unfair in 2022, when it looked like Ato was ready to make this move, I think a lot of people clutched their pearls and got very, you know, oh my God, what's happening to Trangate? All of these stars are leaving. This is the world, this is the existence we've been living in. I would love to know, and we'll find out in the coming months, the structural change that takes place here, because Ato already wasn't working every house show. He was already prioritizing some Noah shows over some Drangate shows, this to me just seems like an official announcement of something that we've already been living in. And that that is frustrating for me as somebody that really wanted Ata to, to grab the bull by the horns this year and become Mr. Drangate and be in a unit and be a babyface and, and be a merch seller and be all these things. But we've all been expecting this. This is not a surprise to me at all. Yeah, and I think like or last month with the... Uh dome show where the the uh, kijimu dome show uh when eta showed up in brand new gear brand new jacket and after basically wearing the same red gear he did throughout the paros run that was like the final tip that i was expecting it imminently so when i woke up this morning and saw these tweets i just went oh all right I, now it's happened because if you are paying attention, if you are listening to us, or if you're just someone who's following Dragon Gate and have noticed, oh, Ata has been effectively marginalized in the booking, it's because he has been get that this has been in the works for probably well over a year. I, I'm waiting to hear back for from some people natively, but that this is something that like everyone saw coming. And I have it it's just not a surprise if you are someone who paid attention. No, this broke on the wrong day because I think we're both waiting to hear back from certain people. But, you know, what I would love to know, and I want to be very clear when I say this, this is pure speculation. This is putting pieces together that might not belong together. But 
you have to remember, you know, Ata is is seemingly a part of pro wrestling Noah's family right now as much as he is Dragon Gate's family. With Noah, you have the cyber agent backing, and although he is a junior and, you know, being a junior in Noah's a, a permanent second place trophy, I mean, it seems like an awful existence. For all of those juniors, Ata's maybe the most focused guy outside of a Ninja Mac, outside of... Um, uh, uh, um, Amikusa. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Sorry. I, I was thinking of his old name. I couldn't think of his mm-hmm. new name. But, you know, he's he's certainly high up in that pecking order. Former GHC Junior Heavyweight Champion, currently the GHC Junior Heavyweight Tag Team Champion alongside Ogawa and that never-ending feud. They don't use him well because it's Noah and it's the juniors and it's just a never-ending cycle of disappointment. But he is ultimately used, and it seems like for as much importance as they do put into that juniors division, Ata is an important part of that division. And I can only assume, and this is, again, pure speculation, I do not know this to be certain, but I would imagine those cyber agent paydays are are pretty nice. And if this opens up an opportunity for Ata to get more of those, then I, I don't blame him. Again, as a fan, and I, I stress this in February when Ray Day Parejas kicked off, and Ata was the most over guy in the building. What was that? What was that first cheer show? Was that an Osaka show that Ata yeah. just stormed into the building? And it was like, oh, that's right. He's a superstar. The first Ray the Pareja show was in Tokyo, but what, there was, what was a the cheer first show cheer show. That. Was it the first Osaka show this year? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. It was. It, he wrestled Fuda, and Ata came through the crowd. And you and I both had the same take on this show. We both had the same take privately. We we're just like, oh my god. I mean. I we both just kind of forgot the fervor that follows Ata, wh- whether it's deserved or not. I mean, I scratch my head at it sometimes. But this was a guy that is certainly beloved by the Dragon Gate audience. But in a way, he's outgrown this position. And and you and I ran across a talking point today from somebody, and I, I don't have any problem stealing this point, as it was a native Japanese fan that made this this point. But look around, you know. Ata's contemporaries are gone. He has no generational rival. He has the class of 2016 already established as main eventers, and he's certainly not a part of that. He has no one from his era. You have to go back to, you know, borderline Toriumon wrestlers, or at, at the very least, Yamato and BB Hulk. Those are the guys that are closest to him, not this new generation. And it's put him in a very awkward position. Uh, from a booking standpoint and just from where he fits in in the overall pecking order yeah and it it is something that like his closest generational peer at this point within the promotion is either yosuke or big r shimizu or ut or ut and you know it's one of those things that with those three people it's very clear why they are not Ata's generational rival even though there's been the yosuke storyline off and on for almost a decade so i I, I guess, like, for me, and this might be a place where we uh, diverge, I think that, yeah, Noah Cyber Agent money, that is absolutely a factor, and it is something that, not with this, and this is just colloquially, I remember, and I forget who exactly mentioned this to me, so I'm not going to attribute it, and I'm just saying, like, this is a recollection. I remember that when... Tazawa left, which, by the way, have you noticed him in the crowd tonight, Case? Oh, I'm I'm devastated he's wearing a St. Louis Cardinals jersey. Yeah, me too. Me too. Best fans in baseball, my butt. Oh, but, the worst. But uh, the, the thing about him leaving and the rumor was about his contract in WWE was he was essentially making the same amount of money, if not a little better. So... There is a financial difference. My thing with Ata and what I think was became pretty abundantly clear was he had to get his time as the lead heel was over. And it just kind of seems like that's what he has the most interest in doing is being a heel. I know we talk about cosplaying Pero de Aguayo Jr. Or Paraguay Jr. My apologies. Paraguay Jr. But that's not a babyface character and that's not a character that necessarily works in Dragon Gate. So it, you, you can call it uh, outgrowing the promotion, which I think is entirely fair. I think it is something that what he was interested in is something that cannot happen in this promotion anymore, at least on a full-time basis. It, it, it all goes back to five years ago. It's, it's really almost beautiful the way this all intersects because 
you know, his guy was T Hawk, and there's an alternate universe where there's there's a four man story of Shima and T Hawk and Dragon Kid and Ata that prolongs well into the 2020s, and and that becomes Ata's thing to do. There's an another version of this story where Ata and Takahiro Yamamura become great rivals, and they're a little closer in, in the generational gap. It, it certainly feels like, for whatever reason, you know, Yamamura and Ishida being graduates from 2015, they feel closer to Ata's generation than they do the class of 2016 with Ben and Hyo and Shun. And maybe that is just time doing that and separating that gap, given the careers that they've all had. But they were an over generation with Ata, and and there's probably a uh, uh, an alternate timeline where Yamamura doesn't get hurt, and it's he and Ata leading the charge into the future, and and even Ishida is somebody that if he was still around, obviously they were going to do something with he and Ata, uh, given their their departure from Red, and you know they both had very strange spring 2022s, and it seemed like at some point that story was going to intersect between those two once again. He just he lost his standing in a, in a promotion where you have guys like Ben and Shun and Hyo that have taken off. And then you also have this next generation with Minora and with Diane, what we just saw with Strong Machine J. And then your SB Kentos and your Kameis and your Kakutas. All of a sudden, this promotion is chugging along. And while, yes, Ata is a ginormous star, he is certainly one of the top five guys on the depth chart. You know, alongside Yamato, alongside Dragon Kid, alongside Yuki Yoshioka, it doesn't seem like a death sentence. And look, maybe if the class of 2016 doesn't catch on, and maybe if the class of 2020 and beyond doesn't catch on, we're looking at a promotion that right now is being built around Ata versus Big R Shimizu. And while I'm sure those matches would be good, I'm glad as a fan that Drangate is in the spot that they're in because they're much healthier than Shimizu versus Ata. They're in a better spot without those guys leading atop the promotion. It's a bummer as a fan that Ata has chosen this route, but it seems like there are endeavors in his future where I have to shrug my shoulders and go, you know what? I get it. I wish he would pop up in Big Lucha. I wish he would pop up in IWRG. I hope that's the case. It would be a bummer if this happens and all it does is free time for him to work and know him more. Yeah, and he is the one person that even well before this, even before he started working Noah, even before Shima left, there was always a time that from things I've heard that I expected him to disappear one day and reappear on a big Lucha DTU show that Cubs fan was tweeting about. Yeah, there was always that part about him that like was always in the picture. And I hope that's what he does. I do. Uh, It does seem that he is keeping some sort of status. If that is that he's considered a freelancer, an exclusive freelancer, if it's a Naruki Doi situation or if it's a Shuji Kondo or someone else situation. We don't know at the time of recording. It's it's 736, at least local time for me. If I hear something from people, I'll jump in and mention it. But at this time, we just know that he will be working Dragon Gate dates. Uh, Case, do you expect really his schedule to change that much? I mean, you look at where it was this week. The only time he showed up this weekend was in or this week was in Kobe in the opener and he was out the door. Yeah, this is this is what I was saying at the top is like I just. I don't think this is the change. And if you look at the announcement that that the Drangate English Twitter account made when Doi went freelance and now this H tweet, I, I think they're worded similar enough to where I just assume they're on a similar deal. And we'll see Ata on some Kobe shows. I think we'll see him in Osaka. I think we'll see him maybe sometimes in Kyoto if he's needed. Some Cork and Hall shows and then the big shows and, and that'll be his schedule. And again, I was obsessed with this idea for the first two months of the year of Ata becoming reborn as a Dragon Gate guy, you know, just falling in love with this promotion again. And for me, hoping Ata would be a babyface and falling back in love with Ata. And I, you know, I, I had the evidence come March that that just wasn't going to happen. So again, this is not a surprise to me. I also don't think it is a shock to the system for Dragon Gate as a whole. I, I think it's business as usual. And, you know, they, they just got their big match with him and Yoshioka. And it didn't, you know, we didn't have any indication they were going to do Shun versus Ata at some point. So 
th- this is the route, you know, th- he didn't have anything big on the horizon. It doesn't seem like he's leaving them high and dry. This is the reality of it. You know, Dragon Gate is not the promotion that it once was. It has a ginormous roster full of guys that not only need ring time, but young guys that deserve the ring time. Guys who, on a show-in, show-out basis, are far more entertaining than Ata at this stage in his career. So it, it, it might be bad PR to some. To me, it's just a part of life. So it's funny that, that, I, fa- that I phrase all that before. Um, I've just heard from a source that it is uh, pure freelance, no exclusivity. So that's a is that a little bit different than Doi's, or is that the same deal that Doi has? Uh, it sounds like it's different. At least the my impression, the way that I phrase it, I basically ask that we're talking about a Doi thing where you get first dibs of dates or true freelance, and the response I heard was freelance. Interesting. Okay. So uh, I still I, I will we'll, we'll find out, but at, you know, as of now, and and again, we record this seven forty five Central Standard Time, basically on March twenty first. I, I I don't think H's schedule will change that much. I'm okay with being wrong on that. Perhaps I'm out to lunch. Perhaps we see him at Kobe World and, and that's it. But I don't get the impression H's in Drangate is changing all that much. Yeah, I am with you on that. That was not the only big event case, however, this week. And we have a whole lot of stuff we're going to get in, into this week. But the next thing I wanting to touch on is off the heels of a pretty standard memorial gate card it looks like we are getting the Dreamgate picture in hand for the march to dead or alive as madoka kakuda challenged shun skywalker everything was set and then who else to show up and rain on the parade it's kota menora are we getting a we're getting a debacle phrase two as we are now having a number one containership match at the august at the april 4th corkin between Madoka Kakuta and Kota Minora to see who gets the dream key and who will likely face Shun Skywalker at Dead or Alive. Case, you called your shot. It still might happen, but you, but you had to know you were going to get a little bit of Kota Minora in on this. This fucking sucks. I, I have no interest in this Minora versus Kakuta match. I, I mean, it would make more sense. Tell me if I'm wrong. It would make more sense to have BB Hulk in the spot rather than Coach Minora, right? I mean, if you look at the booking, uh, Minora's been booked strong, but it, I mean, Hulk makes sen- more sense there. It was something that I wonder, and I will probably reach out and try to find out. I wonder if there's a big disparity between international fan opinion and native opinion about Kota Minora and how he's subjected in this way. Because I feel I, like. I, look, look at the gates from last year, Mike. I feel like the native fans were, were uh, uh, in line with us, not interested. Fair enough, fair enough, but it is, it, it, I don't know why they constantly like to unnecessarily make things complicated for themselves, and then when things turn out the way that should turn out, the booking, it makes sense and is logical, they solve that problem, I don't believe in patting them on the back from that after last summer. Like, Kakuta might, is likely going to win on the fourth and will main event, or at least be challenging for the Dreamgate title at Dead or Alive on May 5th, but why was this step necessary other than needing to have a big singles match in Cork and next week or in two weeks? If it was Doi, if it was Kondo, if it was Casey, if it was Shimizu, if it was Kai, if it was Ishin Diamante, uh, you know, uh, I'll, you know, I'll throw uh, either Mochizuki out there, Susumu, Masaki, or Junior. If it was any of those guys, even if it was BB Hulk, I wouldn't have a problem with it. But this just exposed an old wound that didn't need to be exposed. And I am fascinated to see what Cork and Hall is going to look like that first week of April. If this show does under a thousand fans, oh my God, do we have to reevaluate the future of Coach Menorah's career? And look, the guy's not even 25. There's a part of me that says don't overreact. But if he crashes another gate, as a proposed main eventer, when Madoka Kakuta is so objectively hot right now, oh my god, do we have something to discuss. I I just don't see any reason why Minora should be involved. And if you want to tell a long-term story of him being the Dreamgate ca- crasher, that was fine last year. 
but we saw enough evidence. Look at the houses in June and July, from the June Corkin through Kobe World 2022, and how abysmal they were. And then once Yoshioka got that belt and Minora got phased out of the main event scene, it's weird. Fans started coming to the building again. I guess they were just really busy in June and July as Dragon Gate built to their biggest shows of the year. I, I am so nervous for what's to come. I have the utmost faith, a undying trust in most Dragon Gate booking, and I don't trust this at all. I am aggravated by this decision. I do not like it. I like Minora, yet I want him nowhere near this match. The match is Shun versus Kakuta. They're the two hottest guys with a built-in story that wrestling bookers would kill somebody for more often than not to get something this poetic with those guys being as hot as they are right now. Don't get in the way of this, Coach Minora, please. And I don't think of a better I can't think of a better way to summarize my thoughts, Case Hughes took them all out of my mouth. <clears throat> oh, out of my mouth here. Oh my god, is Mike dying <laughs> on the other end? Mike Spears. I just had a cough. I just Mike had a cough. Spears, a rare on air cough. He couldn't get to his custom built cough button fast enough. Yeah, uh, I'm going to have to wear that. I, I'm not <laughs> editing that out. <laughs> well, l- let's talk about the other stuff that happened at Memorial Gate. We had three title matches Triangle, uh, Twin, and then also the Ryukyu Dragon Pro Ryu Championship. They let off with. The Triangle Gate with uh, Gold Class versus the Rookies and Don Fuji, Kaito uh, Nagano and Yoshiki Kato. It was an R301 on Nagano for Gold Class to make a defense, and it's up on YouTube. I have to say, Case, I feel like this was the most complete Yoshiki Kato performance that we've seen so far, and I think working with my Wrestler of the Month, Don Fuji, is what brought him to that. Yeah, I'm really disappointed uh, Big Dave did not crown Don Fuji Wrestler of the Week that week of the, the Cork and Hall show and Champion Gate in Osaka the first week of March because I, I say it in jest, but also this was a guy who was just doing tremendous, tremendous work as Okamoto blast went out to left center field, Mike, in the World Baseball Classic. That was a bomb. But I, I, the the only performance I think from Kato that rivals this is the Kato and uh, Nagano versus Mochizuki's match from Fukuoka. That was the one that really impressed me from a sense of like, God, Kato could be Sua. He's just kind of this bowling ball that that wreaks havoc, but he's also way more in control than I thought he would be at this point in his career. You know, I, I thought when he debuted in December, we would be dealing with the first year of his career would be kid gloves in short matches and just this overall presence with Kato where you know he's going to be important, you know he's going to be good, but he's not there yet. And you saw it in that Ray Day Parejas match with the Mochizukis, and then you saw it again here where you go, wait, no, this guy's just good. He He's good in a way that's abnormal for somebody of, of his size and build and experience level all combined. And you're right, this felt like a very complete performance. It. It's something with him that he has not sanded down the edges that make him who he is. And I think that's very important. But I, it seems like that there is a confidence in there that is allowing him that, that doing the moonfall. And he did a nasty moonfall in this match. But like doing the moves and performing, he just seems like the more he has wrestled, the better he has gotten. It's the progression you love to see. I mean, you talk about kid gloves, like compare and contrast. This is the, we were probably speculating or in the back of our mind thinking that we had, that he was going to get the Binke treatment for the first year and a half of his career. And no, they've thrown him in with the big dogs. And I mean, this was a 10 minute, this was a 10 minute match. He was in, in his moments. He probably only was in the match three or four minutes, but did not make a wrong step everything looked awesome and more and more i watched it i was like is this don fuji or is this guy like learning and progressing and i had to come to the conclusion that it's this guy learning and progressing you know that's a good way of looking at it is think about where kato's at in his career now and for our our longtime dragon gate fans think about ben k who wasn't yet ben k he was futa nakamura wearing the long black uh trunks in the summer adventure tag league in 2016 and he got concussed in his first match. And, and around that time, you know, before he had the Ben K branding, we all knew he was going to be a star. We were all super into him, but it was, 
a bit like a caged animal. I mean, Ben was reckless and he was out of control. And because he was in Drangate and that was so abnormal, it was really exciting. And we all really liked the, the foundation that was built there. I expected so much of that from Kato. I, I thought at this stage in his career, he would be at an identical point, but it, I don't mean this is a knock to Ben K, but quite frankly, he's just so much better than Ben was, you know, four or five months into his career. Really, not even that is December to to middle of March into March right now. It's incredible. It is incredible just how good he is. And Kaito Nagano, I am out of superlatives for. I, I mean, he feels dialed into this roster in a way that if he were to go away for six months, a little bit like when Fujiwara left last year, we would be looking around going, hey, wait, where did... Where did the guy that has all of the good matches go? I want that guy back. You know, Dragon Gate struggled when they lost Fujiwara uh, in the spring of last year, partially because of Kota Minora and his abysmal booking, but also because Fujiwara was gone. And I, I think the spot shows felt that absence in Nagano is, is now that guy. You know, I, I watch these Kobe shows. I watch these Kyoto shows. I watch these Fukuoka shows in part to see what Nagano is going to do. He's really taken on the reins as the workhorse of the roster right now. And it's something that more so than, than Kato, where you still see some of the jerkiness that you kind of want to see from someone who's going to be a power fighter. Like he's not fast and smooth. He's, he should be a bull in a China shop to use that overly use uh, a proverb. But it, it, it it's something that with Nagano, we have seen, especially like this week, I feel like this week might be in one of Nagano's best weeks of his career between the stuff he did here and then uh, later on earlier today in Kobe. He has really, the like the shakiness that he was having with his flash bends, like it's all gone. And it's one of the, the best things in Dragon Gate. And I say this all the time, the most rewarding thing is watching these rookies over a long period of time progress, improve themselves, move up the roster, and you get your time investment in when you see someone as a rookie. And yeah, you'll get your your Riki Hashis, you'll get your Sora Fujikawas. But when it pays off, it is some of the most rewarding things to watch as a wrestling fan. And we're seeing that in short order out of Kaito Nakano, and that's fantastic. I don't know necessarily what to do with the with the evidence that we're seeing unfold in front of our eyes, but I, I think in some way, Dragon Geek deserves credit for Kamei, Minarita, and now Nagano. These sub five four, sub five three guys. I mean, these guys are miniature, and yet they've been positioned in a way to where they feel credible, they feel important, and even a guy like Minarita. He doesn't just feel like a gimmick. He's not one-dimensional. He's a phenomenal professional wrestler. All of these guys less than five years into their career, and I would trust them to go to any U.S. indie show and be the best worker on the card and to lead more experienced wrestlers through big matches. Like All of those guys, Nagano included, less than a year into his career, they just feel that good. Nagano is a natural in a way where... Uh, again, you know, I make this point sometimes when we talk about uh, other wrestlers where they just they, they've come in during such a great time of growth and prosperity among the young guys that we sometimes don't credit them. And, and Nagano being sandwiched in between Junior and Kato and, you know, some eyes go to Nishikawa. And then you've still got, you know, Minorita now Yanagiuchi. All of these guys are in this bubble and we're all so excited about all of them that I, I think at some point it's important that we we pull Nagano away from the pack and go, man, this guy is a really special pro wrestler. Yeah, and he's still less than six months in his career. He debuted in August. That's insane. It, it is an absolute blast, and it's been fun to see. And, you know, as we get to watch these guys progress, one of the other fun things about this case is soon enough, later this summer into the fall, maybe into winter as it seems to be, We'll have the next class, and there's nothing more exciting than seeing who is coming out of the Dragon Gate Dojo in 2023. And the, with the track record, you know, it's just a, an absolute blast, and I can't wait to see who's next. Yeah, look, it, it's it's not stopping anytime soon. You know, you see you see the young boys around ringside. It, it's just more and more and more and more. I don't think any dojo in the country has an infrastructure the way Dragon Gate does. They, they not only just have 
bodies that you know they've amassed a number of guys the way they pump out quality talent you know this is not the show to do that but oh my god it just it never ends it's unbelievable and and had ata had this a decade ago you know had ata come up with these guys instead of kotoka and kenshin chikano and Maria and UT, with all due respect to them, I think he'd be sticking around. But instead, he he attached himself, uh, maybe not intentionally, but just by the the way that booking works, the way that generations work, attached himself to T Hawk, and that is never a good idea. Yeah, we've seen how that's worked out long term. There, uh- T Hawk and Ashita, by the way, headlining Gleet's April Cork and Hall show. I'm fa- fascinated to see what that attendance number is. Just can't wait to see what it is. Cause it might be, it might be 1200. It might be 1300. It, it also might be seven. I really don't know. Just seven guys. I'm that's 700, but it might just be seven. <laughs> just seven guys. Uh, the second title match on Memorial gate was for the Rio uh, championship from Ryuku dragon pro it was your motto defending against teal and Shisa. It was a Galleria to end this match case. As much as I love the Don Gurkin mask, I am done with this Yamato character in Dragon Gate, unless that's him full time. Absolute heatless performance. I it was like my first gentleman three title match in a long time. I just was not here for it whatsoever. And I love Teal and Shisa and his child and his Brave Gate challenge against Hyo last year. This just was not doing a single thing for me. Punch the Maga was out there just healing it up for whatever reason. And it just felt like a waste of my time. You know, I don't have a written review of this show up at VoicesOfWrestling.com, and I was certainly planning on it all throughout this past week. I was planning on writing something down, and it's not that I thought this match was bad. It certainly wasn't a disaster. I just I thought it was kind of there, and when this match was kind of there, I said, you know, I just don't think this show was important enough to write about, and Luckily, we got we got some help from Phil Schneider at the Ringer of all people, who wrote about the main event. So we got some written coverage that that can be remembered in the remembered in the annals of history. But I, I'm glad you said that thing about punch being out there because I was going to ask you, what did I miss? Why is he there? Why is Punch Tamanaga in this semi main event match between two guys that I enjoy? I enjoy this Yamato character a little bit more than you do, but I I don't like it when punches his attendee and he's playing a giant role in a title match that was very annoying to me yeah it's it, i was actually going to ask you the same question i had a wedding on this day that i was a groomsman at so this was completely out of the question i watched this uh yesterday and i just sat here going like did i miss something over the weekend i i'm not as online as i once was was there like some angle shot that now uh yamato has claimed punch as his attendant like did shingo text him and say hey hey, feel free to beat the crap out of punch and have him come around here we didn't i I don't think that ever happened and the like the the lack of care with that and it's something that like i get it with yamato and with his role and and him escaping from unit warfare at least as he claims for this calendar year which i wouldn't be stunned case i'm gonna put my chip down i think we're getting a yamato heel turn if not by uh kobe world but, uh, not kobe world if not by gate of destiny but by the end of the calendar year because it really does feel like that they're kind of raising up the water laying the frog boy a little bit so that yamato to whatever zebrats becomes zebrats will be two years they'll be ready for it to transition out i think that this is kind of just like t- uh, like preparing everyone for the fact that we're probably going to get a heel yamato run to close out the year and going to 2024 that's interesting. You know, I hadn't really thought about that because I just think Yamato was so ingrained in his current state with the fan base that that's the, the the heel version of Yamato is what we got in this match, which is almost done in a tug and cheek sort of way. You know, it's really over the top. It, it's certainly not the vibe of a heel unit leader in this current incarnation of Dragon Gate. I, I don't. I don't see that happening just for the fact that I don't know if they need him to do that. I would support it. I I think it would be super interesting, but I think they have enough guys now. I think this is the future of Yamato. You know, I think it's this, and then I think it's more units kind of like high end 
uh, with a with a larger focus on the Dragon Kids and the Kagatoris, you know, maybe not the young guys. I think his career is outsider heel when he's wrestling in other promotions, which he's done now in New Japan and in Ryuku Dragon. And I think he's a veteran army guy. I, I think we've seen Yamato as ingrained in storylines as we're going to. Yeah, and that's not to say that Yamato won't have future Dreamgate runs. He's still relatively healthy, and it, there's, and I don't get any inkling that he's about to like to to lead the company or anything like that. This isn't one of those things. I see him more like Masaki Mochizuki, I guess, at going into the future. Masaki Mochizuki got Dreamgate runs into his fifties, and but he was not like a central character as he was in nineteen ninety nine through two thousand three. I would love to know what a 2023 version of Yamato versus Shun would look like because they have such great chemistry. I really love their 2021 match, but it it just seems like there would be a lot of hurdles. I, this is so odd to say because it's Yamato. He's the, the five-time Dreamgate champion, but to get to that point, it just seems like there are a lot, a lot of guys way ahead of him in the pecking order right now at this specific time. And I would love to know if they're going to do that, how they would get to that. Yeah, like he, it, you would almost assume it would have to be a long heel run and you're running out of face challengers that finally a motto the ace of the company steps up, right? In theory. Yeah, that's that. That's where you would have to go. But again, I you know I feel like even like a Masaki Mochizuki, given his history with Shun, he would be in front of him. You know, I, I think Dragon Kid is always lurking in the wings as a possible Dreamgate contender. I think Doi's in the same boat. I think Kondo can't be uh, out of the question in terms of future Dreamgate challenger for Shun. And those are just the, the Dreamgate army guys, you know, the guys without a unit that I think could wrestle Shun. It's very interesting where Yamato's at in his career. I like this incarnation of him. I like him without a unit. I even like heel Ryuku Dragon invading Yamato. This match was fine. It just had way too much punch Tamanaga in it. And that really turned me off from it. Did you not know? Uh, it might have just been me thing. I was stunned how dead this crowd was for it. They did not love this. That, that is, is certainly a reoccurring theme with the Ryuku Dragon wrestlers is I like it. And for the most part, you like it. And I think there's a lot of people on our Discord that like it. But you want to talk about a disconnect between the English speaking audience and the Japanese audience. Uh, some of the larger settings aren't exactly kind to the Ryuku Dragon stars. Yeah, I think that's absolutely fair to say. And you alluded to it. The main event for Memorial Gate 2023 was big time versus the Mochizukis. Uh, KZ and Big Gabash Shimizu make their sixth defense of the Open the Twin Gate titles with a Cobra Twist pin on Mochizuki Sr., Phil Schneider has an excellent recap of it up on the ringer, especially talking about Mochizuki Jr. and this, but case easy match of the night and match of the week for Dragon Gate. What a fun Twin Gate title match. As I look at my match that you're tracking sheet right now, I have a number of Dragon Gate matches at four and a half stars, nothing higher, and obviously a few lower four and a quarter and four stars. Match of the year is still Shun versus Yoshioka to me followed by Kikuta and Yoshioka versus Susumu Mochizuki and Yasushi Kanda. And I would put this match right behind those two. This is a top three Dragon Gate match of the year for me right now. I'm sure that'll change, but I'm sure by the end of the year, this will flirt with my top 10. I thought this was brilliant from start to finish. I'd like to hear your thoughts on it. I was a shade lower. I was four and a quarter on it. It's still probably one of my top five Dragon Gate matches of the year at this time. I just thought it was such a fascinating way of continuing the Mochizuki storyline along with Junior really making this step forward where he decided to basically work the first five minutes of this match as a chin check, trying to see how many times he can get punched in the face by KZ. And Case, it, this won't be a surprise to you, but if you're going to give me people getting punched in the face in a wrestling match, I'm going to have a great time. And it was something that... I the, the there was the moment that during this like opening third where uh KZ really rocked him with an elbow and dragged him to the corner and Shimizu just pounced pounce on him as a monster. And I was like, big time is my favorite tag team working today. This is just exceptional stuff. And that is just like not even to mention that Mochizuki got in there, bailed out his son, who was almost at his level, and we started to get the best chemistry in Dragon Gate of the last decade 
KZ and Misaki Mochizuki. The perfect gentleman, the perfect German kick out going right into Junior did a fucking Orihari moonsault out of nowhere here, Case. Uh, look, this is the best Junior match that I've seen. This beats out Gate of Destiny last year when it was the Ishin heel turn and it was Ishin Kai and Shun versus uh, Father Mochizuki, Mochizuki Jr., and Susumi Mochizuki. This beats out the father son tag team versus Kato and Nagano from Fukuoka, like I talked about earlier, for Rey de Parejas. This is the best junior match I've ever seen. He does, as you put it, the fucking Orihara moonsault to the outside. And his strikes in this match, and that's why Phil Schneider loved this. I mean, it's still it's such a jarring thing for me to read Phil Schneider talking about Drangate, a guy who, you know, is a necro butcher fetishist and a southern indie lover and a guy who focuses way more on punches uh, than moonsaults, let's say. He was attracted to this match because of junior strikes, and I, I was in the same boat here. I, I mean, another guy, we talked about Nagano, you know, debuting in August and being as good as he is, but junior, we're talking about one of the all-time great rookie years, and we just had that conversation with SB Kento, and we just had that conversation with Takuma Fujiwara. It's why it's necessary, and I've brought this up a few times, you know, just the, the young guys in Drangate are changing the way that we have to look at rookie years because we've now got three that I think rival a Kurt Angle, that rival a Jun Akiyama, that rival, you know, if you want to say a Matt Riddle, uh, although I certainly don't want to, but his rookie year was outstanding. This is the company that these guys are in. And Mochizuki Jr. led this four and a half star match. You know, he was every bit as good as KZ was. I loved him and Shimizu in this match. And then even the the, the interaction between he and his father, this was all top notch stuff. Yeah, it is something to go well out of your way for. Case, did you notice that now the, the Dragon Gate Network has things up for longer than two weeks I, or I'm, longer than a week? I, I'm almost afraid to point it out because I'm afraid if I say it, it will go away. Yeah, uh, everyone, you have a little bit more time, it seems, to go watch Dragon Gate stuff. It's not always the seven days. We don't know why it's 14 days. I'm certain we can ask and find out, but wow, it, that this is something worth going out of your way for, and it's... It's something that was even remarkable to see how much Wakiyama that this that this venue and this show that over the years the meaningfulness of Memorial Gate. I mean, case you put it up your you you put it right when you were like, I don't know if I should do a written review for this. I'm not. I don't think we should even really bother going over the rest of the card. Case it just was there to get off my screen there <laughs> at a certain point. But you had a main event like this, and you had an angle after the match like Kondo coming out as Kongo's Shuji Kondo making a challenge for the Twin Gates at Feud. And again, I just, this was like the last 45 minutes of the show where we're by far like my favorite thing on the show. And if not one of my favorite things in Dragon Gate throughout this month. Yeah, great angle here. And it leads to what should be a very, very exciting match. You know, I like all of these guys. I think this is a fun combination, something that I certainly hadn't thought of. And the last time we saw Kano and Dragate, I, he looked like a Dragate wrestler. You know, he looked like a guy that could hang in this promotion. And quite frankly, with the way he's treated in Noah, sometimes I wish he would jump ship. So I am very excited about this. Real quick, before we get into the Bayudin card, can we talk about Wakiyama attendance just ever so briefly? Absolutely. As I would say, a, a really strong number for Wakiyama. I would say a good number. I, I can't give it anything more than that, but certainly not one that caused me to hit the panic button. This show did 453 fans, again, headlined by Shimizu and Keizi versus Masaki Mochizuki and Mochizuki Jr. That number was 453. Last year, did 285 for the Dragon Daya and Yuki Yoshioka versus Jason Lee and La Estrella Twin Gate match. The year before that, 485 so up even over 2023 485 for shun versus kazma sakamoto for the dream gate and the 2020 show that took place in august essentially as as kobe world that year ato over naruki doi in the main event that did 370 fans for reference for another promotion stardom was there in february february 25th uh, for a show where I could not tell you off the top of my head if this was a big show or not, but they did 270 fans. 
Yeah, and it's something that you have far western Japan that's ja- that's Dragon Gate's home base. So, like, even though Wakayama is much farther west, to my knowledge, I'm not looking at a map of Japan right now. I might be wrong. Don't at me. But it's in the the area shows the Dragon Gate's touring tendencies yet again. Yep. So now we have a a hot little Twin Gate match set for that is going to be on the Bayadin show, correct? Yes, they signed it for Biden. We have a full card for Biden. I know we were talking about doing it after the next segment. Oh, uh, do we're you want that right here? That's what I was hoping to do as I had it pulled up right now, because making my life a little easier for us. Biden uh, is returning this year. Uh, we've talked a lot about Biden. We, sh- we should probably take a segment next week and talk about the history of Biden. I, I would do it right here to steal a line from Norm MacDonald. Mike, tell the folks at home what Biden's all about. Biden is Masaki Mochizuki produce where he gets a whole bunch of shoot fighters, shoot wrestlers, uh, the people that are usually kind of you roll your eyes at like Hikaru Sato and then deathmatch guys. And then they just have just really hard hitting great pro wrestling. It's very stripped down. It's on the network here. It used to like it used to like sometimes be an infinity or sometimes being a commercial DVD. It's something that we've talked about as things we were missing years ago, like bringing back Biden and it's coming back thanks to our friends at the Luck Corporation. In case, what, oh, what, are, what are your overall memories of Biden shows? The first one and then the last, like, three that they did in 2011. The first one is on Drangate TV. They dedicated an episode of Infinity to it. It took place in Corken Hall January 25th, 2007, and it's known for a six-man tag of, of Kai and Tai DX to, to bring back Mitch Noku Pro for another week, Dick Togo, Ben's Teo, and Taka Michinoku versus BB Hulk, Shima, and Matt Seidel. And then the main event of Masaki Mochizuki and Minoru Tanaka versus Ikuchu Hidaka and Minoru Fujita. And then there is the 2011 incarnation of this show, which just had an absurd... Just looking at these cards again, 2011, September 7th, Daisuke Sakamoto, Ikuto Hidaka, and Shinjiro Otani versus Masaki Mochizuki, Shingo Takagi, and Susumu Yokosuka. That was the main event for that show. That you know, the rest of the card was nothing, but you had that main event. And this show, I'm excited about, but it certainly feels like a step down from the last time we were under the Bayaden branding. Yeah, I think that another thing about Bayaden, given the time and when things were, that was a time where Dragon Gate was pretty isolationist outside of their own uh, attempts in the United States and the and sending people to like new Japan tournament. So getting to see like that stuff happening under nominally the auspices of the Dragon Gate ring, you got to see people you did not normally see around. And that was really neat for that. And I, I think I'm with you about this as a step down, especially because there's one name I see on the show that I've never needed to see again, but which is a shame because he's in a good match. Yeah. Yeah. But at, at the same time, Getting Kano back, I mean, Michinoku Pro, same tree, different branch. A lot of fun here. I'm going to run it down for us right now, unless you have any other thoughts. No, I'll just point out the last Biden show, and this was November 11th, 2011, 11, 11, 11. That is not easy to say. Semi-main event, Daisuke Sakamoto and, and Masato Tanaka versus Don Fuji and Shingo Takagi. Main event, Katsuhiko Nakajima, Masaki Mochizuki, and Susumi Yokosuka versus Fujita Hayato, Kagatora, and Taro Nohashi. I don't think we have anything on the level of that main event on this show, but I, I, I do think this card is still pretty good. I mean, we do not have Final M2K reuniting. I mean, we, we, we can't necessarily have that. But uh, we, Naka, we open- Nakajima would have made this show so interesting. I'm really bummed he's not on it. Yeah, yeah. I mean... Sponge guy put him in that match instead of Leona, and then you we have ourselves a heater there. I I wonder if Leona is just swimming in a gold plated bathtub when he goes home because of the <laughs> the bookings that he's got from the Lek Corporation. <laughs> and look, I'm I'm a fucking Fuji, uh, Fujinami Mark. I get it. If I could get to Fujinami, and I have to book Leona, I'm all for it. Yeah, yeah, and he's in a match that. You know, hopefully we're not getting a whole lot of them in that. But we have Yamato and Punch Tomonaga, maybe doing the heel invader thing, going against Hikaru Sato of Pancrase Mission, uh, Ryo Kawamura of Pancrasism Yokohama, singles match, Kotomawa Chikawa versus Kunashibo Kamen. 
So we got to have a little bit of that action happening on this. Uh, the original Dragon Gate tag team, Suzumu Mochizuki and Azushi Kanda versus one of the original deathmatch tag teams of Jun Kasai and Takashi Sasaki, both of Freedoms. Uh, we have Don Fuji teaming with Madoka Kakuda versus Masato Tanaka and Takuya Sugawara. That was the person I was groaning about was Sugawara. But uh, they both represent Zero One. Lek Barison special six-man tag team match. Masaki Mochizuki, Mizo- Mochizuki Jr. and Leona versus Strong Machine J, Fujita Jr. Hayato, and Taro Nohashi. And then the aforementioned main event open the Twin Gate Championship match. Big time. KZ, Big Boss Shimizu, defend against Kongo's Kano, and also Shuji Kondo. Man, Leona really sticks out. I, I kind of forgot who was on the opposing side of that match, and I'm now regretting my Leona defense. Yeah, man. It's a. Uh, maybe Junior has to have a lot more chin checks here. I mean, he does have to kind of like get up against uh, Junior Hayato. Yeah, right? Ju- Junior. Uh, Junior Kama Masa- uh, Mochizuki versus Fujita Junior Hayato. That that's a combination that, quite frankly, makes me want to get on a plane. I mean, I want to be in the building for those kicks. That that is what we like to call a spicy little number, if there ever was one. Yeah, so that's April fourth. That'll be on the Dragon Gate Network. I uh, would imagine one of us will review that since it's going to be on the network. Um, that'll be interesting. You know, Susumu and Kanda versus Kasai and uh, and Takashi Sasaki. That is a really interesting match. I don't know what that'll look like. I think Fuji and Kakuta versus Tanaka, and even you know Sugawara is there, and it's unfortunate. But Kakuta versus Masato Tanaka. That's something to get excited about. And then those last two matches, you know, again, you remove Leona from the equation. That's a ton of fun. And then KZ and Shimizu versus Kondo and Kano. That is good stuff right there. Yeah, and it's just interesting. Like, I like the, like, we get the sense that this is really, like, Masaki Mochizuki kind of booking these things. And be fascinated to see someone give them a book. Someone give them the book. Well, whatever, whatever's happening with the office, that's fine. Whoever's in the room. I want to see six months of pure, unadulterated mochi brain happen. Mochiism should be alive and well. Well, I I weirdly think these shows are a great reflection of the Japanese scene because you know look at look at the guys that he used. He used zero one guys in Otani. He used Big Japan guys and in Sekimoto, and I think at times Okabayashi and a lot of Kensuke office guys, and and then you know the the wrestlers he'd get his hands on from Noah. And that fun, just sort of undercurrent of Japanese wrestling, that is gone now. And it doesn't mean that it's gone forever, but like I've stressed before, we're at a current time and place. I think it's the weakest junior scene across the board that there's ever been. And it's reflected in shows like this. You know, it's reflected when you can't pull from Mitch Noku Pro other than Hayato. It's reflected when there's no Kensuke office. There's no young guys there to use. It's reflected when the Big Japan Strong Division, although they're not juniors, when that scene is just completely depleted. It hurts shows like this specifically. Yeah, it's... I would have loved if somehow there was a new hot up and coming big japan strong guy that would I, get up in here <laughs> and go up against madoka kakuda i've been saying that against 26 to, since uh 2016 i think big japan would love to have that guy <laughs> yeah 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 uh, that, that is the most interesting scene where it just all of a sudden one day it just stopped it was like uh, i the last like great sakamoto okabayashi match i think it was 2016 it was July 2016. It was right around World and that Super J Cup and yeah. New Japan G1 Climax. And then it just it just stopped. And I think Okabayashi had a long-term injury and Sekimoto started showing signs of age. And then it was like, well, is he going to be an NXT trainer? What's his deal? He's got one foot out the door. And Kamatani's never done anything for me. And it just, it just with a snap of a finger, Big Japan just never recovered. I mean, that was... 2014 2015 2016 that was as trendy of a japanese promotion as there was in the english-speaking fan base and i I remember going to wars with people there specifically was a daisuke sakamoto versus shuji ishikawa match march 31st 2015 and dylan hales a guy that i respect a guy that i like i mean we went to war over that match because i thought it was a five-star match and and dylan 
Bing Dylan uh, certainly did not think so. You know, thought it was uh, uh, floating, uh, f- floating around being a dud. And it was this great, you know, Big Japan discourse. And, and one day it just stopped and it has never returned since. And that's like reflected by their business as well. Oh, my God. I mean, yes. Th- th- this isn't like international fans. Like when people were like, oh, Collegia Pro, like and that was people are talking about it nonstop because it was free wrestling put on during the middle of COVID. And then everyone stopped and it was like not reflective of reality whatsoever. Big Japan, I mean, the ball stopped and it's not just a perception thing. No, I, as as the flagship podcast pointed out at the start of covid and they were right you know big japan had to keep running or else they would fold they they needed whatever cash flow they could get from those live shows and i i don't know if they ever took a break they you know whereas drangate you know paused at the at the beginning of march and then came back into the empty arena march april may I, big japan i know at one point pivoted to empty arena but i don't think they really ever stopped operation because they couldn't afford to and they had the whole issue with fan fundraising, a bus breaking down, and all yep. that too. Oh, yes, they did. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, that was not the Biden angle was not the only big angle, as I misattributed it earlier. They had two other shows that happened over the weekend. Nagoya, the after the Nagoya Nate event, that was when we had the Kota Menorah debacle V two happening. But we also had. Some interesting stuff happening with the Mochizuki family that continued into Nagoya, then onto Kobe, Kobe today. Case, yeah, very much so. It looks like M3K, if they're not coming to an end, it is certainly not all right in the extended Mochizuki family. When you factor in Susumu and Kondo, we had a match booked uh, coming off of today's Kobe Sambo Hall show for this upcoming Cork and Card in uh, the first week of April. Yeah, so I, I want to touch on the Nagoya match, if you yep, don't please. mind, for a second case. So this was on the 19th on YouTube, the Mochizukis versus Punch Tomonaga and Hoho Loon. And one of the more fascinating, like, booked matches where Case, Junior refused to tag in his dad, and that basically lost in the match because he basically made it into an impromptu uh, handicap match. Yeah, really interesting stuff here. L- like I continue to say... There's just a level of care with Junior, and it, it's not that I think the the Drangate Booking Committee, whoever they may be, wherever it might be, is careless. Case, who's in that room? Who is in that room? Well, I mean, it's a public facing job at this point. It's it's been all but said to us. You know, it's <laughs> GM Rio Saito is is not exactly a gimmick. <laughs> but um, anyways, I there's just it's not that they've been careless with the rest of the roster but there is a certain level of care that is put into juniors booking and here was just another step along the way i really loved what i saw yeah and also on this nagoya show like we talked about the main event angle up here there's dragon kid and naruki doi and versus kz and jason i'm convinced now working kz i'm working jason versus dragon kid at dead or alive I'm I'm all for it. I, I I thought the angle there would be Doi, but Dragon Kid is just as good. Yeah, it's just something that they keep on facing off in singles matches. I mean, talking about Kobe, Aita's last match. Did you watch Aita's last match as a as a full roster member? It was rather unspectacular. I thought. Did I miss anything important there? No. Like the the biggest thing about the match was Jason versus Dragon Kid. Yes. Yeah. Which you know, fantastic. It's it's Jason Lee and Dragon Kid. It you know that that's the combination that works. And then I you know I was unfortunately distracted by both Genki Horiguchi and Ata existing in that match, and I don't want to say detracting, but they were there. Yeah, and then I will, I'll run down the Kobe results in a minute. But I watched through this entire card. I managed to make time of this. The only other thing that I made you stop and watch case was this spicy Don Fuji and Kaito Nagano match where they teamed again against Big Boss Shimizu and Daiki Yanagiuchi. And I I went four stars on this case. I adored really? this. Yeah, I loved it. I, I am I am not that high on this, but I, I still thought it was great. And it was kind of another one of those matches where, you know, I'm going to reiterate the point I made earlier. I watched Kaito Nagano here, and I go, Jesus Christ, he's how many months into his career and he's doing this? I mean, this was a full-service performance. He and Fuji... I love what they've done here. You know, there's no official alignment. I love that it, this this is unfortunate because I love Don Fuji so much. I love that they haven't Fujied Nagano and Kato up. 
and that might still be coming. You know, they might put on the sumo sandals. They might get new names. They might get new costumes. But I love that right now Don Fuji is just teaming with these young whippersnappers and getting great results out of it. And it's something that can play into the overall Mochizuki storyline with uh, Junior utterly hates his dad's best friend, Don Fuji. And he sees his classmates finding success under this guy's tutelage. That's a way to get get ourselves a, a generational rivalry kicked off, right? Oh, completely. That's I mean, it's it's what I love about Junior is he's basically inheriting twenty years of, for lack of a better term, lore. And you know, I spoke on this a month or two into his career. I said, you know, I really think there's an interesting angle they can play with Don Fuji here, and they have leaned into that in all the ways that that I wanted them to. And then we got this bonus of now there's Nagano and Kato with Don Fuji. Yes, they lost the Triangle Gate match, but. You know, I, I wouldn't rule out another big match for that trio at some point. And Junior's got to deal with that now. There's another layer to that Junior story. You know, even in a match that he's not in, I feel like Junior is such a prominent part of this match just because of the long-term ramifications. Yeah, and uh, what were your thoughts on Daiki? Because I came away f- from his Corkin debut going, okay, at least for this night I, in this venue, this guy was like a local god. The crown connection continued over to, to Kobe. He might have something there. I think Daiki is going to be such a great small room act. You know, I, I think the first few times around the loop, especially Kobe is going to be very friendly to him. Osaka is going to be very friendly to him. Kyoto is going to be friendly to him. He's got Cork and Hall. That, that one's locked in. He's good to go there. I, I'm really curious to see, and I'm assuming he's going to be on the Dead or Alive card. Well, it would be fascinating to see if he's there and Rio Fuda is not. Again, just completely conspicuous by his absence, Rio Fuda, a non-entity at this point. But I, I'm curious to see how he'll project in a big building because I like him on these house shows that I've seen him in. I liked him here. I think he's a very talented wrestler. His His presence is so over the top that I wonder if it'll actually work in a big room or not, or if if he is a touring act that is going to work in these small towns. In a way, this will sound condescending, but I I think his ceiling is a little bit higher, in almost like a way of a Sachihoko boy, where you show up to your hotel conference center with 200 Rowdy Drangate fans, and you see Daiki Yanaguchi, and you think, okay, I'm home. This is Drangate. This is the good stuff. I see him playing into that role eventually settling down there. But from an in-ring perspective, I thought he was very good in this match. And he went up high for the choke slam. Yes, he did. <laughs> yes, he did. And, you know, Don Fuji might adopt him because every time he's faced Don Fuji, he has shaked his hand and, and Don Fuji hasn't wanted to lay him out. Yep, it's great stuff here. Again, Fuji, Yeah, I, I referenced Phil Schneider earlier. You know, that that's a guy that if, if Fuji had spent his career in Big Japan or All Japan or, or working Noah undercards, he would be heralded as as, you know, a hidden gym of the two thousands and a sneaky, you know, all time great wrestler. Just worked in the wrong promotion to get that buzz from the English speaking fans. But you see here, even well into his fifties, Don Fuji is is not only a guy that we can sit back and go, Oh, he's great, you know, he's funny, I am Don Fuji goodbye. He's a wrestler that brings so much to the table. He's so worthwhile. It's so valuable to have him on these shows. And the work that he's done in the month of March 2023 has been remarkable. I mean, I'm so glad that he's around. I'm so glad he's as relevant as he is. He has been phenomenal this month. And and just to to make it crystal clear, everyone, my Don Fuji love is not based on irony. I fully love this wrestler. He he's not like one of my top three Dragon Gate wrestlers of all time, but he is someone that I will be, I will be crestfallen for days when he announces that he's going to wrap it up case. He has just been such like a heartbeat of the Dragon system for so long. And he's continue, continuing to contribute in its 24th year. I mean, we almost have had a, a quarter century of Don Fuji. Are you ready? Or Don Fuji in the Dragon system, his career started in 97. But case, are you ready for the 25th anniversary and Don Fuji just lining up rookies and being the crap out of them? I truly can't wait because I felt like his 20th anniversary special was a little strange because it kind of, if I remember correctly, got lumped into Shima's and it was like that weird, like Shima and great Fuji. Sasuke. Yeah. And then the Sasuke showed up and whatever Sasuke shows up, I tune out. So I'm, I'm hoping for better in his 25th anniversary. Yeah, they were doing Sasuke Gumi. 
stuff like like they were kicking it back to that era of michinoku pro and seeing 50 year old men doing the crazy fucking pose just like they, they, there's not charm there with that no there look i don't find any charm in current day sasuke i just <laughs> not it's not for me i i think you have to go back to like the king of trios that he worked to find the last time that i was into that act but i will say the gold class incarnation of the crazy fucking pose, which I always label as the crazy max pose, uh, just a, a chef's kiss. The the gold standard <laughs> of unit poses, if you ask me. And specifically, if you go back to Memorial Gate, you watch that opening match, there's a moment where Ben K is distracting the referee, referee Yagi, while Minora and Hulk and Minorita are getting in position. And Ben looks behind him and sees that they're all stacked up, ready to go. And in the snap of a finger, he slides into position, and it is the the greatest uh, comedic moment of Ben K's career. I can't believe it took us this long to unlock this version of Ben K. We've had our love affair about it. I've said it before, but oh my god, what an act in gold class! I mean, he has just completely turned this unit around. You, you know, uh, we, I should have seen this coming a little bit, Case, because I remember like we were talking about the. Dragon Gate Dojo watching the World Baseball Classic victory over Mexico and how everyone was getting into it. I remember when he was the dojo dad and it was pizza day and he and I have a photo saved on my phone of of him opening up a box of pizza and basically doing the chicky chicky don uh, a chicky chicky Ben K pose to it. We should have <laughs> known then that he had it in him. It's just trying to find a way to bring it out. I, I never saw it coming and yet I'm so glad it's here. Yeah, uh, let me run through the uh, the results from today's uh, Kobe Sambo Hall show, if you don't mind. Yeah, please. This is the show I watched up to this point of the card, the uh, Shimizu and Yanagiuchi versus Fuji and Nagano match. And as of the time of recording, I just have not seen the rest of the show. So apologies, I cannot break down the second half of this card. Yeah, uh, I, I'll toss in my thoughts uh, when we get to it. I, I, I'll be honest, Case, you, you saw what I thought was the best part of the show. Okay, good. So... Uh, six matches, the Kung Fu Masters, Jackie Funky Kame, Jason Lee, and Ho-Ho Loon defeat Dragon Kid, Gigi Horiguchi, and Eita in, in Eita's final match as a Dragon Gate contracted wrestler. Uh, it was uh, Jason Lee first knocking, almost knocking out Ginky with like a cross with a form. Good closing stretch by those two, by the way. It, it's hanging. crazy, by the way, that they've got Jason Lee and Coach Minora doing these forearm gimmicks now, because that was one of my big takeaways from the Triangle Gate match and Memorial Gate was towards the finishing stretch, Minora hits Nagano with a forearm shiver in a way that just kind of made my jaw drop. It was so violent and unexpected coming from Minora specifically. Yeah. And he like hooks the, the other arm. So it's it traps great. Him. It's a great it, move. It's sick as hell. Sick as hell. Uh, second match, Minorita defeated Punch Hominaga with the Minori Tanic. Uh, it was eight minutes. That tells you what you need to know there. The aforementioned Don Fuji and Kaito Nagano defeating Big Bashimizu and Daiki Yanagiuchi with a choke slam on Yaganuchi. Konamawa Ichikawa, Sachi Okoboy, Kagatora, and Takashi Yoshida defeated the full complement of M3K as it was a backfire of a Jumbo no Kachi hitting. Uh, hitting Masaki Mochizuki, going right into a Kaganui. And th- after that, we had the angle setting up the original tag team versus Mochizuki's at Korkin. Uh, semi-main event, Yamato and Suji Kondo defeat uh, KZ and Strong Machine J, uh, King Kong Lariat of Kondo over J. I thought it was mostly kind of fine. Uh, three-way trios, Shun Skywalker, Kai Hyo defeat D Courage, uh, Yuki Oshioka, Dragon Daya, Madoka Kakuda, and Gold Class, Kota Minora, BB Hulk, and Benke. This was a one fall to a finish match, and it was when the uh, knee salt was on Daya. I just, I, I kind of came for, away from that match cold, to be honest. Like, like it wasn't a bad match. It, you know what this match actually made me think? Zebrat somehow has really been whittled down to basically these three guys in Ishan, and Ishan hasn't really been around since the end of Ray de Parejas this month. They lose something without Diamante. There's just a certain yeah. flair that he brings to the table that is that is needed because Shun and Hyo and Kai more or less bring the same thing to the table. You know, it, it's it's heavy character work. It's hard hitting. It is you know, it, especially in the case of Hyo. 
a thinking man's heel, and Ishin certainly doesn't have that, and Diamante doesn't have that, and when SB Kento was in the fold, he didn't have that. So you had a very diverse unit at one point, and with the injuries and with these uh, with the excursion, it's suddenly not that. Yep. Yeah, uh, did see on Twitter, I don't know, it was since we recorded, uh, Diamante posting saying, hey, uh, surgery went well, I'm well on the road of recovery, and he was eating an ice cream cone. Love to see it. Yep. Uh, uh, one other thing from Nagoya, okay, so we did not touch on. Uh, hometown native UT was at the show. They did have the full six-man version of Party Anthem happen, did not make the YouTube cut. KZ tweeted afterwards that his doctor has okayed him to the next level, and he's able to do the dance, and he's preparing for his return. Yeah, UT, not KZ. KZ is uh, perfectly healthy as far as I'm aware. But yes, UT did the dance in his hometown. In a show, Mike, I, I want to briefly touch on the Nagoya attendance because it's a, oh, a favorite do. topic of mine. They did 1,002 fans for this show. And as I continue to bring up, you know, this was in the Nagoya International Conference Hall. I think when other promotions run it, it's under a different name on Cage Match, which is a little frustrating. I think it's the Nagoya International Conference Center Hall for other promotions. But uh, looking at this last year, you know, March 20th of 2022, they did 551 fans. August 7th, they did 608. December 12th, they did 969. And then here, March 19th, 2023, 1,002. Stardom is a really interesting uh, promotion to look at in this Nagoya market because they've run shows that have hit 1,200 fans in this building over the last year. And they've also run a show that had 466 fans in the building this past year, that same venue. And I don't know enough about stardom, quite frankly, to figure out why that is. I just know there is a drastic uh, dip and then increase in attendance, depending on what they book for these shows. But the other promotions, you know, All Japan ran here three times last year, 400 fans, 500 fans. Noah ran here once last year, 559 fans. And that was a pretty loaded show. Big Japan did 324 fans here last August. DDT did 529 last September. They ran this building February 18th of this year with the Rookie Doi versus Canada in the main event, 398 fans. So you're looking at a promotion there, DDT, even using a Drangate guy, they scraped 400. Drangate now doing back to over 1,000 in this building. My, my larger point here is this is as good of a market for them uh, as, as uh, any other market other than Tokyo, where they're still obviously, uh, you know, very strong as is almost every promotion, but Nagoya is a sweet spot for them. You know, Nagoya, Ichi specifically Dragon kids, hometown, UT's hometown, SB Kento's hometown. This is where they clean up. And I'm really excited to see what the number for dead or alive is this year. Last year, they did 2640 with Kai versus Susumu on top of the Aichi prefectural gymnasium. And I think they can flirt with the business that New Japan has been doing there. They just ran that building uh, as I quickly scramble to try to find that number. Uh, New Japan has run there twice this year. They did 1650 for Shingo versus Great Okan headlining in New Beginning in Nagoya, that MMA rules match. And then uh, 2190 for a New Japan Cup show. So in the big building, in the big Aichi building, Dragon Gate, Dead or Alive, uh, outdrew those shows and outdrew a G1 show that they did in the same building last year. So very interesting stuff in Nagoya. I mean, I know I went through that uh, kind of quick. Does that all make sense, Mike? Yeah, and I, that just leaves me with one question. How can we convince Gaora to add Nagoya back to the TV loop? I wanted to see this full show. I, you know, oh, yeah. The, the, did you watch the YouTube upload? Yes, I did. I, went, I loved it. I, I went four stars on that main event. That was D Courage versus Zebrats. And I know we just sort of ragged on Zebrats there, but that main event was excellent. And we got Jason Lee versus KZ, or Jason Lee and KZ versus Dragon Kid and Naruki Doi, which I went three and three quarters on. And then the aforementioned Mochizuki's versus Ho Ho and Punch match. What we didn't get was Ben, uh, ben K, BB Hole, Coach Minora, and Minorita versus Genki, Nagano, Yamato, and Kato. Uh, Big Boss Shimizu versus Konamami Chikawa. And Susumu Mochizuki and Yasushi Kanda versus Jackie Funky Kame and Strong Machine J. I would have liked to have seen those matches. Yeah, I, I'm really intrigued by that. Uh, 
Natural Vibes team. You don't see a lot of Kamei teaming with Strong Machine J. No, but I, I like that idea, at least on paper. Oh, yeah. No, I, I, I feel like that there really is money in a big, small tag team with Kamei as the small guy. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm, yeah. I'm with you there. I'd like to see more of that. Yeah, no, uh, let's bring it back to the loop. Let's do that. Uh, no more Dragon Gate Network shows for the month of March. They will be back with uh, Biodin and also Corkin on the 4th. Case, we have one last thing on the docket. I am ready to remember a guy. This week, Remember a Guy is brought to us by our friends at Canadian, at Canadian Broadcasting Company, CBC. Uh, restating the rules, as always, Case will get six clues. Play along at home. The first clue is always what their dojo era was. If if K somehow was able to name it, if it was Torimon Japan and K said Dragon Kid, and if he was correct there, 10 points. From there, we have five clues of not very useful to incredibly useful and letting Case figure it out there. We'll go five, four, three, two, one there. Case, are you ready to remember a guy? I am ready to remember a guy. What do you have for me this week? He is from Dragon Gate next. Is it Lupin Matsutami? You're in my brain a little bit, but I like where you're thinking. No, it's not Lupin Matsutani. Okay. This person, like Daiki Yanagiuchi, former staff member at Dragon Gate at one time. Uh, now I'm trying to think of the Dragon Gate next guys. Is it Kenshin Chikano? No. Okay, thank God. I I don't I don't want any more hints for him. <laughs> uh, uh, he is known as someone who had a big cult native fandom in his Dragon Gate tenure for four points. Can you remember this guy? Dragon Gate next cult following. The way you phrase that makes it seem like he's not around anymore. Ow, who who was that guy? Um. He, I, actually, I just saw his name on a buy it and show, but I can't. Oh, was it Katsuo? It was not Katsuo. Uh, this cult fandom got him into King of Gate. Case, we play in honor rules here. Got him in a King of Gate. It, hmm. Is it Problem Dragon? No, it's not Problem Dragon. I, and you were alluding to something. And when I was talking about cult fandom, I believe this person is completely out of wrestling and no longer a member of the Dragon Gate office. A certain time ago, he was removed as a staff member. Removed as a staff member? I, at least from the roster page. He was a listed staff member on the roster. Oh, huh. I'm trying. Well, the only, the only staff member I can think of is Anthony W. Morey, but... He's he's still around, and he came in earlier than that. I'm trying to think of this person. I don't. I the only name I can think of. I'm not even sure if they're considered next or if they're considered something after that. Is it Kotoka? Good guess. It is not Takoka. Uh, he went before that. Uh, the last clue, the best clue. This person's gimmick while in Dragon Gate, at least the one under their their name tozawa juku's bannerman oh no oh this doesn't help me at all um <sighs> tozawa i can't even think of who was in tozawa juku because it was arkin and tozawa obviously and katsuo i think mm-hmm <laughs> it's not you know, eventually you're going to have a tozawa juku related question in this game, yeah right? it's not it's not el generico no it is not el generico although he is completely out of wrestling el generico of course of course okay so that huh Th those are the members of tozawa juku i can think of ah uh... yeah i don't i don't know case this week we are remembering koji shishido i yeah i i could not tell you a thing that he did i know so, that name but 
So Koji Shishido, uh, for those who did not know in case, uh, he was a Dragon Gate Next member who worked in the office somewhat after he was outside of active participating. He was incredibly popular when Tozawa Juku formed because he was a stoic, silent flag bearer. And no one really, they didn't really portray him as a wrestler until he, I think it was Don Fuji, who like tried to like rip out Tozawa Juku uh, flag. And then he flipped out. And they had like a fan vote one year for who should be the like the wild card into King of Gate, and he was voted in. And that was pretty much the end of Zaujuku was pretty much the end of his end ring career. However, allegedly for a couple of years there was someone uh, with his body type who uh, wrestled under as one of the Mass Florida brothers. Yeah, I I don't think I've ever seen that angle. That that is new info to me, and I'm I'm very glad you gave it to me, as I always enjoy some Tozawa Juku lore. Yep. Uh, the other full time roster member who you left out, actually, there's two. Uh, uh, Tozawa Juku, one of my other guys, Taku Awasa, and of course, uh, part time a uh, Tozawa Juku student who graduated before the rest of them, Anthony W. Mori, or as when he, or as in that gimmick, he wrestled as Hakiyuki Mori. Yeah, I it it a lot of these hints made me think of Mori, but the him being in the next class really threw me off. Yep, uh, that is usually the most useful hint you get before we get to the end is the class. Yeah, well, I I enjoyed that very much, Mike. Another week where I can't get it right, but I enjoyed it. And I look forward to playing again next week. Yep, uh, I'm going to change it because I did have Kenshin Shikano planned as next week. And he's too oh. fresh in your brain. He's too fresh in your brain right now. But, but I look, I, I change it now, but don't worry. Kenshin Chikana would have been well out of my brain by this time <laughs> next week. I have. You, you, you got to know, I will always have a bunch of guys for us to remember. But Case, unless you have anything else, let's get out of here. No, that's, that's all I got. All right. Uh, thank you all for listening. If you would like to support the show, you can click the link in the show notes. It'll take you to our redcircle.com page. You can click the red box. Sponsor this podcast and you set up a one-time or reoccurring donation. No obligations whatsoever, like I said at top, but we'd like to thank all of our previous donors. The best way to help open the voice gate out and getting new listeners is to go to iTunes, Apple Podcasts, whatever they're calling it now. I've never, I've not used that app like in a decade case. I think it's Apple Podcasts. It I've is. signed us up for it. Yeah. Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, rank, rate us five stars, leave a review. I don't know how the algorithm works, but it helps people discover the show. You can follow us on Twitter at OpenVoiceGate. Cases that underscore in your case. I'm at Fujiheya. Thanks for listening to the VoiceGate. We'll be back with you next week. Take care, everyone. Music. It's not just part of our daily lives, it's part of our wrestling fandom as well, and it has been for decades. That's where this show comes in. Music of the Mat, the podcast devoted exclusively to the music of pro wrestling, hosted by Andrew Rich. Hey, that's me. Each episode delivers a different topic with a variety of great guests, fun conversations, musical analysis, and of course, a heartfelt pun or two. New episodes drop every other Tuesday on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or your podcast app of choice. Check out Music of the Mat only on the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. Hello, do you like New Japan Pro Wrestling? Are you a Shin Nihon freak? If so, check out the Super J Cast with Joel and Damon on the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. And even if you fucking hate New Japan Pro Wrestling, listen to the Super J Cast anyway. Not just for our great show reviews, analysis, and pastrami sandwiches, mm-hmm. but there's also usually some dick jokes somewhere in the obligatory opening 30 minutes of absolute nonsense we chat about every single week. That's the Super J Cast for all. All the best talk about New Japan Pro Wrestling, crisps, and pornography.